In a prior video, I went over how to layer your clothes properly and be prepared for cold weather environments. In this video, we're going to go into that more, except for we're going to go beyond the main clothes layer, core layering as I might call it, and go talk about the gloves, the hats, the masks, the shoes, and other things that you might wear to keep yourself warm in cold weather environments. This will optimize not only how you travel, but understanding what kind of gear you'll need to bring to those cold weather environments. Further, how you can make the right decisions and purchase the right gear for flexibility in the future for your cold weather travels. Now, let's go over all the essential pieces aside from the core layers that we discussed before that you need to be ready for your future winter travels or cold weather places. All right, let's kick things off with gloves. There's essentially three different sizes of gloves that you can consider for your trips. The base layer is a thin but surprisingly decently warm layer that you'll put directly onto your hands. As so, see it's thin and some important features of this layer is I often like to have something that allows me to touch my smartphone easily, especially in cold weather. And these gloves will be the first thing you put on when your hands start feeling cold. The base layer is sometimes also called a liner, but importantly, they should be comfortable and will always be next to your skin. But they are decently thin. They provide very little warmth. So on top of these, you'll generally have another medium layer. And so there's obviously different levels of thickness for the medium layer. And you'll notice that these, I have very high dexterity with these gloves. And so they're perfectly good for operating on my phone, you know, maybe in writing a pin, they're pretty operable. Now we're starting to talk a little bit less operable. Medium sized gloves, you should still be able to use tools like hiking poles, ice axes, and, and be able to operate some, some general equipment. Uh, and there, I obviously have some uh, mountaineering gloves that really favor dexterity. You can see, I still have good dexterity. I can still grab things, ice axe, no problem. These are obviously made for the, the metal poles uh, or metal handles of the ice axe and uh, they have good grip ability. So you want a good grip on the palm as well and uh, still good dexterity. These will keep your hands warm and your primary go-to if your hands are starting getting, still getting cold while you're moving around. And of course I have these which are, if for not super cold environments, these are usually enough for many things. And so usually maybe warm weather or like nighttime kind of things in warm weather. And, and this is definitely more for cold environments. One important distinction from other types of layering I talked about is the heavy glove generally doesn't go on top of your medium level glove. So, you know, normally you would think that intuitively you just put it on top. No, it doesn't work like that. Usually you'll take your medium level glove, put it aside, and then you'll put on your heavy jalopy size glove. Now look at this thing. This is like a freaking oven mitt. This has the puff. The heavy gloves are really uh, very for a very uh, important purpose. Usually when you're resting, sitting down, uh, or taking in the scene at the top of some peak, you'll put these things off, usually at rest. Or you obviously don't have the ability to use many tools with this kind of thing, uh, but they are super warm. If, you're, if you are in a station or if you're injured and you need to be stationary in a cold environment, these things will come in super handy. So these, this is what the purpose of this glove. It's very niche use case. And so you won't use this thing often. And, and honestly, in a lot of trips, I don't bring it. It's so warm, my hand's getting warm right now. And so, yeah, these, this is really good for those extreme circumstances. Honestly, you probably won't need it. Medium and lightweight gloves are usually most uh, good enough for most trips. Next, we have our hats and our caps. The main purpose of a hat is to help keep the sun out of your face. And so they provide a, that with the bill and there's many styles and varieties of hats. But for one, I favor the baseball cap, the traditional, and it's easy to control. One important thing is that some some hats need this uh, flexibility, uh, flexible adjustment, and, and these are, are fantastic. Let me get really close. These flexible pieces are very important when you're expecting 
winds because I like to keep mine a little loose because it's more comfortable in my head but the moment there's wind it'll fly off my my head so if I'm expecting wind I'll tighten it down maybe a little less comfortable but allows me to keep the cap on still you can also put your hard shell on top of it and ratchet down your hard shell on top and that helps keep it on as well but there's uh, different ways to keep it on and obviously you can only do that with a baseball cap that's in front the where the bill's in front of your face one other feature that I like in baseball caps but this one obviously isn't is they have these flexible bills now uh, that still keeps the sun out of your face but there's pros and cons to an inflexible bill this one obviously is very not flexible and, and you know obviously if I try and smash it down it probably ruin the bill but nice thing about flexible bills is you can smash into your backpack in any nook and cranny or your travel bags and they're just much more easy to travel with because you can fit them anywhere these aren't that big of a pain but honestly it, it has a shape and this is a little bit harder to pack. Another nice to have is a cap, especially for cold weather environments. There used to be a thing a lot of people were saying where a lot of your heat escapes from your head. That's not really true, but what is important is a cap does provide a little bit of heat, especially for your ears. When the wind's going and it's howling, you will feel your ears just shrivel. I mean, they get so cold. And so this helps quite a bit. They keep keeps it a little bit warm. And another thing is when you're moving, you will get sweat on your forehead. And so this helps with some moisture wicking as well off and from the sweat rolling down your face. So it has a bunch of different purposes and you can wear it underneath your hat. All right, now let's talk about buffs, scarves, and neck gaiters. Buffs or scarves go around your neck and they come in a variety of different shapes and sizes that we'll talk to in a minute. But the most important thing is they protect your neck from sun and wind. And you can bring them up across your face to keep, if the trail is dusty, from breathing in a lot of dust. And it can also keep heavy wind off of your face from getting frostburn on your nose and ears especially. And you can even bring it above your face onto the forehead to help keep sweat from rolling down your face. There are kind of three different types of buffs. There is this short one, which is great for summer weather or if you just want to protect your neck. It really doesn't cover your face very well, but it can be used a little bit for that and is good for being quick dry because it's smaller, it's a little bit more comfortable. It's, it's good for just neck coverage and you can see that it covers my neck very well for keeping that sun off of it. And these are generally called half buffs. And then you have your long buff that goes on top of it. You can see it's much longer. It'll take longer to dry and generally you want to sweat in this one less. But it provides a better purpose being that you can wear it in all sorts of different styles. Ninja style. And keep a thicker thing around your face and cover your ears. You can even get it to cover more of your forehead if you want. And so there's a lot more options with the full buff. It uh, with the exchange, uh, it dries a little bit slower. So they both have different purposes. I have both and I use both interchangeably. And I don't have one here to show you, but there's also the winter buff. The winter buff is just like the long gator that I just showed you, except for it's a lot thicker and it's kind of like this material and it's generally also provides warmth. These really don't provide warmth, that's not their purpose. They're maybe a little bit warm, but they, that's not their purpose. While the winter gator will help you keep warm. And if warmth is your concern, you also have the traditional baklava, which there's a whole bunch of different type of baklavas, but the baklava is really a full face kind of thing. And this is also similar to a winter, uh, winter neck gator or buff. Next, we have sunglasses. Generally, any sunglasses will work for travel, but if you're going to high altitude or you know you're going to be on snow, you generally want more polarized and darker sunglasses. They will generally, uh, the snow is very reflective. It reflects light and because you're a higher altitude, there's more UV. And so not having proper eye protection can actually call cause what's called snow blindness and snow blindness can actually make you permanently blind so it's not a good thing to explore and that's why having proper eye protection is important also something to consider is your goggles you can wear these on top of your glasses 
uh, and generally these are nice as alternative to mountaineering glasses because they protect eye corners. When you're in snow environments and there's heavy wind, that snow, those little flakes can tear your skin like little sh ice shards uh, and, and they can be very painful. Uh, and if any have the potential of getting through your eye cracks, or these side walls, they can get to your eyes and that can uh, cause blindness and so it can be a very big concern and so goggles uh, can be nice to have but they're not very packable so an alternative to goggles is also the traditional mountaineering glass which is generally like this and so important thing is you'll see coverings on the side walls and these go and generally wrap they won't fall off your face so even if you do fall, you won't lose your glasses. And they have sidewalls to protect from the little eye shards that come to the side. And uh, another important consideration I mentioned is it's really nice to get sunglasses that are tight on your head because you know, when you're active and traveling around, the last thing you want is them to fall off, cause trash somewhere, or, and it's also easy if there's a big gust of wind, I've seen it just rip sunglasses off of people's face. So something that is decently wraps your head, or you can buy a rip cord or something like this works well too. Next, let's talk about shoes. Shoes is a deep topic and because it's on your feet and your feet are one of the most important things that you need to move around it can be a very sensitive topic and it can get very technical so i'm really going to just graze the top of what a shoe is but i want to give you some pointers and to understand certain concepts of what makes a shoe a shoe and so first of all let's talk about your normal street shoe street shoe usually has a decent sole to absorb the impact as you're walking and generally has a very flat sole the flat sole is good for street. It's all you really need. And maybe they're more stylish. Maybe that's the intent of the shoe to be stylish, but uh, you know, obviously functional wise, less important. So let's talk about the hiking shoe. The hiking shoe has a lot more uses and being out in the wilderness, you don't know what you're going to encounter on that trail and obviously this will hold up quite a bit better. Some features of the hiking shoe that you get over a standard shoe is water resistance. So you can see that there are very little seams in this hiking shoe. Obviously this one has had a lot of wear and tear. Now, I'm not sure if you're seeing that. I glued, I, I, I literally used shoe glue to <laughs> to fix some of the seams. So the more seams you have on the hiking boot, the more uh, failure points you have. So generally, if you inspect a boot, the better, the less seams it has, usually the better quality. But anyways, less seams, less, uh, more water resistance. And it will have a decently thick sole. You can still bend this shoe, but it is decently hard to bend in comparison to the street shoe, which basically caves in no problem. And so this provides, this thick sole helps provide uh, protection from sharp rocks and gives you, uh, uh, and, and gives you some stability on the ground. Another important thing is the tread. See how the other shoe was flat and this one has little grooves. These grooves in mud or, or rocks will help you have grip on non-flat surfaces. And so that's also important for the terrain that you're going to be walking on. There's a whole bunch of different types of rubbers uh, that uh, I usually get vibrant rubber. It works fairly well, but there's probably a whole bunch of competitors. I, I don't know the differences to them, but generally you want something that's going to grip wet rocks and optimize for that scenario. So hiking boots generally grip wet rocks better than other shoes. And so uh, another thing is the ankle protection, which is a big important thing for hiking boots because they're generally a lot stiffer. And this gives you roll protection because when you're on uneven surfaces and rocks may shift or you may, may slip a little bit, if you don't have strong ankles or maybe strong balance, this ankle protection will help try and keep your leg and your foot erect as it's moving without the ankle support and, and it's up to your balance to recover. Imagine 
falling over your ankle. That's how you break your ankle uh, and cause sig significant uh, damage to your joints uh, and your tendons. And so it's bad news. So this ankle protection can help save your trip <laughs> if, if you have it. So now, hey, hiking boots are really a great go-to for most people who are beginner travelers or beginner hikers for and I won't say don't don't take this to the city. It's obviously not a city boot, but this is for just going to like Turkey and doing some easy hiking around Turkey. You probably want a hiking boot anywhere that's going to be on uneven surface. I generally will bring a hiking boot, especially if I don't know the terrain. It's a good go-to shoe. Also, as a side note, even if you're losing some water resistance in your hiking boot, they have waterproof socks, which also add quite a bit of extra water resistance. So if you know you're going to be on a muddy trail or going through and wading through a, a small river for, and, or fording a deep river, you can bring water resistant socks, which as long as it doesn't go over where your socks sock line is, they just do an amazing job. So you can have a water resistant boot and water resistant socks as extra protection to keep those feet dry. Also to note, because they do have stiffer soles, that means they are going to eat up your feet more than a standard shoe. These aren't like bouncy and comfortable. I mean, they are comfortable and they will protect your joints, but that's maybe not the purpose of the hiking boot. Their hiking boot is really protection for your feet against unknown terrain. However, uh, you'll want to, if you buy a brand new hiking boot or mountaineering boot, you because the stiff sole, you'll want to break them in. So just like start wearing them and literally walking around the streets, do some, a whole bunch of walking and even hiking in it before you do the harder stuff because these will tear up your feet. The more you break them in, the more gentle on your feet they will be on those long and weary trips. And now let's talk about the mountaineering boot. This thing is like everything that I told you about the mountaineering boot, except much, much more hardcore. These things, there's a whole bunch of different competitive boots. Uh, and, I, and I know this is going to be very limited use for most of you, but I want you to understand the basic features of the mountaineering boot. And, and that is, it's even more water resistant. <laughs> it is more water resistant. There's like no seams. These things are made very well. You cannot bend these shoes. They're not meant to be bent. These things are so stiff. So again, that stiff sole is just gonna chew through your feet. It is <laughs> there will be nothing left after wearing the shoe. But anyways, it's not for comfort. It's not for having a party. It's for protection for your feet against extreme environments. And so one of the things that you'll notice for mountaineering boots, it has this groove. I'm not sure how well you can see that and on the back and this groove allows crampons to go on the shoe uh, and also super deep grooves those are much deeper than the hiking boot this is because you're treading on snow and glacier with these and you need that four by four action that these provide also more ankle support because it's even more unstable and more unknown environments and so you really don't need this kind of shoe unless you are really doing glacier kind of travel or really high and, and treacherous mountains. So, uh, but I wanted to introduce them. And next, you'll find the Trail Runner. The Trail Runner is, is basically your cross between the street shoe and the hiking boot. They are so light, I can smash them. It's almost like a normal uh, trail uh, it's almost like a street shoe but it's it's not quite I mean you will see that uh, they're generally very lightweight material they optimize for lightweightness and there's very little material at all they're not water resistant and so forget that maybe some of them might be but most of them aren't uh, but they are very breathable and they generally have good soles because you're in kind of rocky terrain um, and they're meant to be absorb more impact they're generally more comfortable than a hiking boot and they help absorb more impact so uh, and also one important thing is no ankle support they sacrifice a lot for giving you speed and mobility and and uh, maybe some more comfort with the cushion. Just to, some of them don't have cushion. Some of them have no cushion. And some of them are like barefoots. And anyways, but important thing is they're a lot less and then I can move. So I would consider trail runners kind of more advanced, being that 
I generally don't wear a trail runner to somewhere I haven't hiked before. Being and, and, and for, for beginners, I definitely recommend a hiking boot. Stick with the hiking boot because it offers so much more protection. And I, I hear so many more people just like thinking, oh, these are so much better. And I'm just gonna start doing trail runners everywhere and then they get hurt. And so um, you're sacrificing protection for a lighter weight shoe. They do wonders. And if you know the trail very well and you're gonna go for a jog on that trail, these are great. But uh, be careful with these. Don't over rely on them because you're sacrificing protection that the hiking boot offers. Next, you have gaiters. Some people love them, some people hate them. I swear by them. They are fantastic for the, t the purpose that they provide. Uh, some people don't like them because they make your feet more warm. In particular, my feet, I really don't care if they're warm. It doesn't bother me too much, but some people are more sensitive to it either. So, uh, Gauge the kind of gator that you need based on your own needs. Because I'm not that picky, I only have one gator. And if I need a gator, this is the gator I use. It's the long one, it's the longest one. It's the mountaineering gator. They have smaller ones, they have trail runners. They have like really tiny ones that just wrap around your shoe and wrap around your ankle. But let's talk about what they're used for. So here you have a strap. This strap will go on the bottom of your shoe and, and wrap your shoe in a way that's fairly tight around the shoe. So it's trying to prevent things from getting up and into your shoes. So for example, like little rocks that get into the grooves here, and I'm sure you've had this experience, a tiny little rock and it's just sitting there step after step, just poking your foot. And it's the most annoying thing in the world. Gators help with that kind of thing. They also help in, and this is important, in snow, because if you don't have a gator, snow is also going to get in there and it's going to make your feet super cold. It's gonna, it's gonna make them wet and cold and they're gonna get chewed up because they're moist. And so trying to deal with moisture management is pretty difficult. Obviously, probably trail run, if you're using trail runners and moisture is your concern, it's probably a wrong move. So use a hiking boot. There's still more for you to learn about cold weather clothing and how to keep your core warm and how to layer properly. I have another video on that and that's perfect for you next.